How you doing, man? I'm here with Sean Dalkey, vocalist of Half Hearted, audio engineer, full time dad. How you doing, man? Wow, this is a good intro. Dude, I've been practicing. I thought about it all night. First one, killed it. Yeah, dude. That's, I don't know if I've ever start. been introduced that well. <laughs> hey, man, if, if it starts well, the rest of it's going to go downhill, though, yeah. so we might be in trouble. Yeah, but let's recoup. Hey, <laughs> cut there, start again, that's yeah. it. Next episode, we'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about Half Hearted, being an audio engineer, then how it all changes the dad. So starting back, like, how did you get into music and audio engineer? Like, I think... It, all these self-employed industries are fascinating to me because no one like takes a linear path. I feel like no one like as a six-year-old is like, I'm going to be an audio engineer. Yeah, it's right. like you started playing music at 12 and somewhere you're like, oh, I kind of like this shit too. Yeah. And then it went from there. Like, how, yeah. yeah, how'd you get into it? It was a lot like that. It was, um, I basically just picked up a guitar when I was like 13, 14. Yeah. And hold on, I'm going to sneeze and I'm going to ruin this whole thing. Let's go, dude. If you don't sneeze, it's even more ruined. Yeah. <laughs> We're fucked. <laughs> You're good. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. It just, just slides over here. All right. Cool. Just ruin the whole show. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I, uh, like, 13, 14, I picked up a guitar, and uh, actually because I got grounded, funnily, funnily enough. Um, Are you grounded a lot as a kid? I was, because my, <laughs> my parents, boy. and not because I was a bad kid or anything, or because I allegedly. did anything crazy, yeah, allegedly, yeah. but... Um, until like high school, my parents like harped on the grades thing, sure. and I was like, "School's not for me. Like, I know school's not for yeah. me. Like, this is not where my life's gonna go." Um, thankfully, I was right. I guess I don't know how that would have panned out <laughs> if I had yep. a different mindset. Yeah. But um, so yeah, I was grounded, and they were like, "Hey, the only person that we're gonna let you hang out with is your cousin okay. because he's older than you, and he must be a good influence." Uh, and he brought over two guitars, and he was like, "If you're grounded, we're just gonna play music." And I was like, "Okay, if a cousin cool. with the two guitars was a good influence, I'd hate to meet the rest yeah. of your cousins." Yeah, seriously, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so he taught me how to like read tab, and okay, yeah, yeah, play like the basic chords, and I was like, "All right, this is like fun." And then, um, and then I was a couple years later in high school. I was dating a girl named Holly, and like my first girlfriend and we were both in drama okay. so we were in the um like auditorium or school yeah and somebody like left a mic plugged into the pa so i was just like messing around i was just like singing like to her like i was yeah, singing yeah. The, the song holly like the all-time low song okay. and in walks nick viglione the boy and he's like and i had never even met him before current basis and, of half-hearted for yeah, context yep yeah i had never met him before and he but he was friends with holly so he walks in and just starts kind of like watching and they start yeah. talking and whatever. And then he was like, I started a band like weeks ago. You're the singer now. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll like whatever, yeah. like I'll go with that. So yeah, so started going to band practice with him and oh, yeah. a couple other dudes that I haven't talked to in, since then probably. <laughs> what was the name of that band? Uh, first one, Weekend Drive. Actually, you know what? I have talked to one of the dudes because the drummer of that band was Kevin Stevens. Damn, dude. <laughs> or I, may, maybe that was like the second iteration. I think the first, when Nick first brought me in, I think the drummer was this dude, another, I, another Nick. I love how every local band has like 12 yeah, volumes right? of it's characters like, and it's like kind of the same 10 people, just different times. Just, yeah, and, we're all just yeah. trading people throughout bands and shit. Yeah. I love like Metalcore Wikipedia because the bands have like timelines of graphs of all the members. And like, yeah. They used to see a red bar like pop up for a month. And yeah. It's like six months here. And, for this one yeah. year. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so it was, um, yeah, it was this dude, Nick. We used to call him Big Nick. He was the drummer. Okay. And that did not last very long. <laughs> we didn't record. We didn't do anything. It was just like we were just jamming. We were just sure. having fun, um, mostly covers. And then, um, and then, yeah, and then when we got slightly, I guess, more serious about that, Kevin Stevens, mm -hmm. the former drummer of Boundaries, for mm -hmm. context, um, joined and <laughs> We started, I think we played maybe one show, maybe two if we played like our high school talent show too, I think. Um, <laughs> two bangers, yep. yeah. Yeah, So And yeah, our first show ever, or my first show ever playing in front of people yep. uh, was at this place called the Pine Loft. Okay. And it was like this like hole in the wall, like pizza bar yep. Um, yep. on the Berlin Turnpike. And it was like, and it was crazy. Like we packed it. It was <laughs> us and one other band from our high school. And they were actually really good. Like looking back on it, it yeah. was like we were fumbling and they were like really good. And none of those dudes play music anymore. I kept That's in touch so with them. Funny. But um, but yeah, we, we packed the place with just like parents and shit. Yep. And one thing led to another and boom. 
Um, in my first year of shooting, we shot a show at a, it was like a cookie store. It's called like Hardcore Sweets or something. And it was actually dope because all their menu items were like related to bands and stuff. But you still walked in. It was a bakery. It was like a very bizarre place. Uh, but it was, I think it was like Awaken Providence and someone else was playing. But I, if I remember right, it was Awaken Providence with Will Ramos at the time, who's now with Lorna Short, yeah. killing with them. And I looked back and I was like, how the fuck did they sell out an ice cream shop at the time? And That's then, so yeah, cool. Look who yeah. that guy became. Uh, so yeah, it's fun to look back on those like nothing shows, all the Point Beach shows of like, yeah. damn, dude, we, we went through some shit. Dude, yeah, Point Beach. Those are good memories of Point Beach. Go, that dude. Cool. There's a Point Beach was like a, what was it, a uh, beach shed kind of in our area? It was like there's yeah. a beach nearby, and this is where they kept the stuff in the off season. So in season, when the stuff was out of it, they would put shows yeah. on in it. It was maybe, it was probably like two blocks from the beach, too. Yeah. The building was falling over. Yeah. Like all the windows were broken. It, like 20 <laughs> feet wide and 50 feet long, maybe. Yeah. Like it was a, it was a shack. Yeah. People but smoked cigarettes inside. It great was like times, the dude. grossest place great ever. Times. Yeah, it was oh, great. It was I awesome. I my phone volume on. What a new move. Um, it was awesome, though. Dude, I remember there was a fridge behind the bands, and that was like my, I would get up on top of this fridge and sit there, because yeah. it was the only place I couldn't die. Yeah. Everywhere else, I was like, oh, I'm fucked. Yeah, There's e- no- yeah. even behind the band, you're like, there's <laughs> yeah. people going crazy and shit. That place the, was the fun. The back door, like the hallway in was always crowded. You're like, how is this? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> how do you even see from there? Like, why are you back here? Yeah, those were good times. So when does it shift from that into now half-hearted and full-time? Like, when does it become real? Like, at some point, you're in high school, I assume you're working with these band members who are kind of on and off and you're kind of going like, "Ah, I think I'm more into it than they are. Like, I think I really want to pour me into this. Yeah, it was, um, we started recording in the like Kevin Stevens early days at Kevin's house. Perfect. And that's, and I didn't know anything about it. At that point he had equipment. He also didn't really know anything about it looking back. Define equipment. Cause I feel like it was a janky. Like, yeah, he had like a pack of sure mics and, uh, like, one like task cam <laughs> eight input interface yep. and like free audio software Hell yeah. and that was it Hell yeah and That's all you needed yeah. all you do need so yeah. but and i was like i was like this is more fun for me yep. than like actually playing the music like trying yep. to figure out and it, i think it was because the first time we tried to record it came out so bad yeah and i was just like <laughs> I'm not normally bad at stuff, I guess, like right off rip. And that like enticed me. I was like, I'm bad at this. Yep. I, I like that I'm bad at this because yeah. I have so much room to improve and yeah. so much to learn. Yeah. And that like motivated me. Like, yeah. there are people out there that are so good at this and I suck. Like, that's, I need- <laughs> a, that's a weird thing. It's, it's fun you point that out. So I get into video. Essentially, I just wanted to learn guitar. I was kind of, yeah, I was in eighth grade. I was like, I like music, but I don't really have an involvement in it. I'm going to try and learn guitar because it seems like a cool thing to do. And yeah, I learned two songs and quickly realized I hate the instrument. I don't like learning it, but I really like figure, filming the covers once I learn the song and do it. Yeah. And eventually I'm like, why? I can just like outsource the music part and just do the camera part yeah. and then, I, then I'm set to go. Um, but it's funny because you mentioned like, yeah, you find it. I had the same thing where I started filming. I was like, this sucks. Like this can be so much better. And this sucks. And I'm working so hard and it still sucks. Yeah. And it's weird how that can inspire you or like with guitar is like, I still suck. And I was like, fuck this. Like I, it's just somehow didn't click in my head to want to get better at it. And it's weird to find something that's like, you hate both of them equally, but for some reason you hate in a, a fond way. And one of them you hate in like a disdain way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I feel like anything that I've tried and been like decent at yeah. first time I've tried it or like sports growing up, I, yeah. I like was the kid who was just like good at baseball without yep. ever practicing or caring and stuff. Yep. So none of that ever motivated me. Yeah. And as I got older and didn't care about those things, everyone around me got better because they did care. (laughs) So I kind of fell off. Yeah. And then I poured myself into like the thing that I was worst at because I just had this like motivation to be good at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird phenomenon because like I said, my story is very similar. Uh, and yeah, it's weird how that the brain works in that way. It's like you had so many avenues that are are favorable and ready to work out. You're like, nah, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna go with this bad one. I'm gonna go with this one. I suck at. <laughs> yeah, because it's more fun. Yeah, yeah. and but, yeah, so I just started like we we tracked with that band, fumbled through mixing it. I don't think we ever put anything out. Actually, we just did it. <laughs> um, and then after a couple years of that, I ended up getting my own gear and my own mics and set up like a studio in my parents' basement because I was obviously in high school. Um, and we did an EP. I was in a new band now uh, with my friend Matt, Josh, and Nate. Yeah. And um, 
We were called Shorelines. We were called Shorelines. Okay. And uh, it's and half bad band name, honestly. Yeah, it still kind of holds up a little bit. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> but we were, and we sounded like Mayday Parade. It was like a pop rock, you know. Sure. It, was, it was probably two thousand and eight or okay. nine, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I recorded for us, and I threw together a mix and relied on some of my friends that were good at it to kind of guide me and teach me things and whatnot. Actually, Zach Cervini was okay. living in Connecticut and lived in Torrington and was a big part of the like Connecticut music scene. Yeah. He was recording a band that we played with almost every weekend called All Hands on Deck. Yeah. And he was at all their shows, and like so I got to meet him. Obviously, he was already really, really good. Yeah. So... I was probably a punisher to him in the beginning, like, hey, how do I do this? Like, how do I do oh, that? Dude, you I know? Back my first year and I'm like, oh, some of these people I work with now, like, thank God they forgot about that yeah, first year. Dude, seriously. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and then I just, um, I fumbled through mixing that little EP for us. Yeah. And then we started selling it at our little shows. And a couple of the other bands that we were friends with and played with all the time were like, hey, this isn't half bad. Like, where'd you do it? And I was yeah. like, my parents' basement, <laughs> come on over. So and I started recording other local bands just for free, just to figure stuff out and be on that side of it and not be mixing my own voice and the songs that I wrote and stuff. Yeah. And then after high school, we I kind of took a, like, t totally stopped doing that. Like, I took a break from that. Um, and I started just working, like, retail, like, full time. Just because I moved out of my parents' house right after high school, like, less than a year after I graduated. Um, which no was, college, no, no post, uh, nope. nothing. I just, just, so you my, knew you were off in the world. Yeah. So my um, my senior year in high school, I was able to get out half day. I left Perfect, school at like yeah. 11 because that, that's how many credits I needed. Um, and I went straight to a warehouse job. And I was like, I hate this. I'm not going to do a warehouse shit for the rest yeah. of my life. Yeah. So that summer, I got a job at Leslie's Pools just because it was right across the street from my house. Sure. So I was like, screw it. And <laughs> Easy I didn't commute. Let's go. Yeah. Right. That's all that matters at 18. <laughs> and I didn't hate it because the people that I worked with were cool. Yeah. And I didn't hate retail, but yeah. I was like a sales associate and I was dicking around, yeah. you know, yeah. and very quickly because of the way that that company is structured, I like had my own store. Like I was like, Heck yeah. I think I was 19, maybe just turned 20 <laughs> and I had my own 1.5 million dollar store <laughs> dude and, and we did all of that 1.5 million dollars in like four months at and 19 like, years old i was running a summer camp with 130 kids coming in every week how did they let us do this shit for the <laughs> 15 and they were like peter you, can you got this. it yeah you got this. we trust you i'll take care of oh dude it got gnarly and like uh, for a while, you're just taking care of kids and you're managing counselors and it's okay. And then might be like, as you get deeper in, like, because there's a hundred whatever kids, like some of them come from tough places and you start sure. getting DCF phone calls and it's like, I'm 19 yeah. years old. Like this, this is a little is, heavy for me. <laughs> this is way above my pay grade to start yeah. working on this. Uh, but yeah, at 19 years old, it's like, dude, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's I'm not lot. qualified now, much less seven years ago Seriously. or five years ago, whatever. Yeah. And I'm, like, 20 um, working, like, 60-hour weeks, yep, like, going yeah. home just, like, miserable. Like, my whole life yeah. was this store. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, like... I go home talking about the, my kids. I'm, like, dude, I'm 20. Like, yeah. I I'm, like, I don't... And I, that's when I was, like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life yep. either. This sucks. Yeah. Um, and so at that time, my wife, Lisa, um, was going to school to be a dental assistant. So she was working, like, mornings at Duncan before school, like, nothing crazy. And I was, I had my own store, so I was, like, kind of the breadwinner, like, sure. taking care of our finances or whatever. But then, so when she graduated, she got a dope job, like, yep. making the same amount I was with my own store. So I was like, all right, my turn. <laughs> like, I'm now going to, like, dump myself back into the music thing. And Hell at yeah. that point, Half Hearted started while I was full-time in the retail world. Yep. Um, and we were going to record with Bryce because there's no freaking way I would have been able to, yeah. like, work, write, mix our stuff well, like, do any... I was basically just showing up and singing, yep. you know? I would, yeah. Jay would write our songs. I would, like, he'd send them to me, and then I would, like, write lyrics on top of them, and then we'd go to Bryce. Um, it's a very different process than we, we have now. Yep. But... Um, so we were working with Bryce, and that was cool. And then um, when she got her job, I was like, all right, I'm going to start recording bands again. So I set up a studio in our condo. 
we started doing all of our pre-pros and demos for Half Hearted at my studio. I started shopping those around to local bands, and then I started just recording a bunch of locals and making pop instrumentals for people. And, and that's when I wrote the Sorry song, was yep. that year. Yep. And then I got really, really busy doing top line writing. Yep. Um, and early on, like it, it was tough because it's not that I didn't have a lot of work, but it was that I had to diversify what I was doing every single day. So every mm-hmm. single day, although I was only making music, I was doing a different job. So yep. like one day I was editing vocals for something. The other day I was editing drums for something. Mm-hmm. Today I'm writing a song for somebody. Like yeah. today I actually have a band here. Like yep. everything was different. I feel that. Yeah, I think in the <laughs> video world, it's the same thing, especially as you start adding video into photo. You're starting to do both. And then it's like, wait, I'm photographing portraits and concerts and this live event. And then I'm making a music video and a corporate yeah. video and a lyric video. And it's like... I can't wear all these hats. Like I love doing all these things, but at a certain point, like you got to pick which thing I'm going to commit to. Cause yeah, I can't be good at 10 things. I'm, I'll be yeah. lucky if I'm good at one thing, but I'm definitely going to fail if I try 10 things. And I'm sure it's the same in the video world as audio world. It's like you are almost looked at more as an expert if yeah. you have like one thing that you do. Yeah. So financially there was no way I could just be like, I'm just a mixing engineer. I'm yeah. going to mix songs every day and that's going to be that. Because yeah. I w- there's no way I would be able to sustain yeah. that. Especially, yeah. you know, I had like a year basically to just piss away to be like, all right, you're making all the money and I'm good. But at the end of that year, we had a kid, we yeah. bought a house. Like yeah. it wasn't that anymore. So I diversified. I took every job that I could get. I still worked for free mm-hmm. on projects that I believed in like yep. I just did everything I could do to just Absolutely. do audio all That's the time the grind, yeah and uh and then yeah now it just kind of developed into what it is it just yeah. got got busier I built a bigger studio after we bought the house I just spent the week putting a new floor in the studio oh I'm yeah. excited to see it yeah it's cool it's one of those like um polymer floors okay so they like it's like a bunch of little plastic flakes they grind down the floor okay and then they put this like epoxy goop down on it and then they like throw these like just handfuls of like plastic flakes down okay and then they seal it all with like a clear shiny coat it Fire. looks cool it looks like a marble floor yeah basically yeah hell yeah so, dude i'll be yeah. dope add to the vibe in there yeah. so yeah i now you're working full-time now this is a full-time investment you mentioned that there's lisa there's a child involved like how yeah how does I assume working from home becomes a huge asset when you have a kid and obviously Lisa is at work and she had some time off, but she goes back. But how does that change being self-employed, being creative? Like I, yeah, I take a lot of pride in being self-employed, but doing, keeping myself afloat is tough and then keeping myself afloat while maintaining another life and financially supporting that life and keeping a relationship up. Like that's, that's a lot of hats to wear. That's a lot to take care of. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, so I'm still not, awesome at work-life balance. Yeah. Um, not because I don't want to be, but because, so that first year, Lisa was working five days or maybe four or five days a week still. Um, out of necessity, obviously. And when your son's like first year you're talking about? Yeah. So yeah. The, yeah, the first year that we, so we had our son and then, uh, we bought a house two months later. Um, so that whole first year in the house, that was 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, we moved in in August. So, or October, so October to October, um, she was working like full, full time. And I was home with him every day. Mm-hmm. And then I was booking half day sessions from like five to 10 at night. Yeah. And then full day sessions in the weekend and like doing remote work, like basically overnight. That's gnarly. Yeah. yeah so it was tough. But because of that, then I got busy enough to the point where she was able to find a different job working only three and a half days a week. And then that gave me, like, now she works half the week, I work half the week. So that cut down on how much I was having to work overnight, thankfully. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. my my schedule sucks when I have to get my own self-care, squeeze into my own errands, like having to get a kid, and especially a newborn, like that's that's a lot of maintenance to keep them afloat, keep them happy and running around. Definitely. Um, But I being self-employed is always so fascinating to me because there's no guide to it. Like uh, you have your son, you have to figure out your own way to make this work. And I think even the learning part of it itself is the same way. Like there's no one who says how good of an audio engineer you have to be to be qualified or it's hard. It's rare that a client comes to you and goes, you're a good mixer, but your low ends always suck. Like, you know, you don't get these, you get a note from a client. Like I don't like the low end here, but it's hard to know how does this 
fit in the big picture? Like, where am I actually? Like, do you find yourself still taking time to just learn and do stuff for fun? Or do you feel like you're, I feel like I get tied to client stuff a lot and it's hard for me to take a day off because I start exploring the fun stuff. I'm like, ah, oh, this is guilty. This person's paying for my time. I should give them this time instead of exploring these five hours just for my own shits and giggles. Like, Yeah, I still set time aside almost every week to just like practice and get better. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the practice I guess that I get is from just being really experimental with half-hearted yeah um because I'm doing 100% of all that production and stuff with Jay um so that's where I get to just go off creatively and kind of like try out new things and if it sucks it's not a big deal because I'll just undo it before it comes out type thing you know um I'm not like bouncing it off a client who's gonna be like wait what did you do? Like you yep. changed it a lot, you know. Um, yeah, that's yeah, Jay always gung ho for all the adventures. Like he's yeah, yeah. once to a song goes. Jay, Jay is he's good about he he's gotten better about it. There, <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, when I wrote or when we wrote "Breathing Pattern." That was the first song that we wrote for the record, and it was when our writing process like started to change. So me and Jay wrote that we wrote that song instrumental first, both of us sitting there. Um, crafting the instrumental and he left to get food and I added the whole horn section to the song okay and when he got back I was like Jay I had an idea I added a horn section to the song he was like no he was like absolutely not like that's not us that's not good like I don't like it I hit play and he was like nope never mind you're right but do so whatever you funny. want. <laughs> feel Jay. You spend so much time with him, your energy, his energy comes through you. you yeah. He like had knee jerk reaction, like horns, like no. And then the second we listened, he was like, oh no, yeah, okay, cool. We use horns now. We do that now. <laughs> That's dope. Yeah. That's cool. So it's, it's cool. It's, it's, it's definitely different working me and Jay than it is with other artists. I get to take more risks and do more things. And we're, and Half Hearted is still so like, I mean, maybe in Connecticut we're like, big ish i guess um but in the grand scheme of things we're like nothing so we can still just kind of do whatever the hell we want um like if we blew up tomorrow we'd probably take down everything we've ever done and then (laughs) re-release certain things not re-release certain like we're we're still in the stages of just like throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks i think um like we still write heavy songs yeah we still like we I, i we probably have an equal amount of like pop songs and like have like volumes riff songs like that we could release tomorrow what and we are like what do we what do we want to do here <laughs> percent like i'm sure uh maybe not every song gets to 100 percent but how many things do you have that get to 80 percent and never see the light of day for half hearted oh a lot like uh, like 100 would, songs 10 songs uh i would say there's probably 50 songs in existence right now that could be released this week that are 80 percent done yeah or, yeah yeah down yeah that's weird what is it just a gut feeling of what to release are you going through the archives going these five go well together like how does that process like yeah so i do my best to once i hit bounce on a song and i send it to the guys and they're like yes this is cool like the mix is good and stuff um i try my best to just be like okay what do you guys want to do now yeah because i'm so involved up front yeah that maybe I feel like I'm way too close to the music to like make yeah. decisions like that. So I rely heavily on the three of them to just be like, yeah, like we finished this one, but that's not it. Or like, let's do this one next because we really like this song we released two months ago did really well. And this one's kind of like it. Let's finish that one and follow up like mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I rely heavily on them to like guide me, I guess, yeah. <laughs> in what we should do. Jay does all of our release stuff. Yeah. So like once I send the song to Jay and I'm like, this is the final mix. And he's like, I have no notes. He plans. He's a planner. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if we do end up dropping heavier songs soon, it's because Jay decided to. <laughs> hell yeah. I'll put a good word in his ear. I'm curious to hear what that sounds like. Yeah. Uh, I still man. That's dope. So looking forward, I think my other big thing with self-employment and just, yeah, work-life balance is like, I can't imagine being 60 years old and like having a normal life in this industry. Like I think you, uh, for me on a video level, I'd have to specialize and become someone's special effects guy or someone's whatever, someone's DP yeah. or get to a point where I have those people under my umbrella, but I can't imagine doing it in this version when I'm 60. Like 
but I also think it's at a certain point, it's like we're in so deep in this self-employment thing that it's going to be real hard and unappealing to go a different way. Yeah. So I always wonder like, yeah, where does 60 year old Peter end up? Cause I don't think it's here, but I, yeah, who knows where it is. Dude, Cause 20 year old yeah. Peter didn't plan to be here. So now five years later, it's like, I don't, uh, I don't know what's going to happen in a couple of decades. Yeah. I mean, I try to not think about that far ahead because that'll yeah. just stress me out. Like, yeah. I feel like I have imposter syndrome like every day anyways. Yeah. Like, I'll be mixing something and throw on a reference and be like, nope, like, I suck today, like, or whatever, you yeah. know. And then other days, I'm like really stoked on stuff I work on. Yeah. So it's like, it's a toss up. And going back to the like, we're... Um, taking time to like hone in on skills and stuff. I still do nail the mix too. Yeah. Like I still do that oh, yeah. almost every month. Oh, um, yeah. I'll set a little bit of time aside to, to bang that out and, and or watch the class, you know, like learn mm. new things, see how people do different stuff. Like even just last month they did, um, George Lever mm-hmm. did two songs and his workflow was so similar to mine that it shined light on like two things that I could do better. And mm-hmm. I was just like, boom sweet and now yeah. i feel like everything i've done since then is like five percent better mm-hmm. so it's still like i still definitely am like practicing every day <laughs> i gotta get better at that i think i'm good when a client says we want this thing it's easy for me to fi- dive into that thing and figure out yeah what that thing is and that. Yeah. how that thing embarks and ultimately that yeah learning how to pin text to the wall ends up translating to something else. So it, it is learning and it's, I'm learning this thing, but it does translate. But yeah, I'm not good at just being like, it's Sunday. I'm going to take three hours and just open up After Effects and see what comes out today. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think there's a, a confidence that comes there. I think for me, it's almost like an insecurity thing of like, no, I need to keep working. Like I don't quite have time to take my foot off the gas yet. Yeah. And I think there's a confidence that comes with it of like, no, I can take my foot off the gas for a couple hours today. And I have explore. to try to almost do the opposite sometimes too, where like I will... I'll be working on a client thing and I'll stop trusting my gut mm-hmm. and I'll be like, I'll, I'll spend way too long, like trying out 16 different guitar tones or something. And yeah. it's like, stop. Like, that's when I know I need to just like take a step back and be like, all right, does this sound like a song or not? Because yeah. no one's going to realize that I just tried out 16 guitar tones. <laughs> like yep. no one's hearing all of them in comparison. Yeah. Does this one sound good? Yeah. Is, does this sound like a song is the only thing that people are thinking yeah. about in, at the end of the day. Yeah. So Sometimes I'm I'm overly analyzing and I'm like, all right, I need to take a step back from working on client stuff mm-hmm. because I'm getting obsessive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I've I think I'm getting good about trusting my gut or just accepting that like I don't have anything other than my gut. Like I don't have a technical back. I don't yeah I don't know how to quantify these things. Like all I know is what I think looks cool and hopefully that lines up. And yeah, there are principles I'm aware of and whatever bullshit. But like yeah, I, I think it's interesting that we all are skeptical of our gut, but it's also like, that's what got you here. Yeah. Like you didn't get here because you learned, like ultimately it was what you thought felt good, felt right, sounded good, worked well. Yeah. And I mean, like it, we work with you because we can send you a song and be like, Peter, what do we do? Yeah. How do we, how do we look like this? I song? always ask myself the same question. <laughs> how do we look like we should play this song? <laughs> I always figure it out. Yeah. I think it's a, I enjoy the process of, yeah, every song I get is a new version of something. And it's like, yeah, how do we bring this to life? I think it's a really exciting process of, yeah, figuring that out and figuring out the context of half hearted or whoever else the client is and each each artist tone and their voice. And yeah, yeah, it's a fun project to be set together. So I appreciate you guys having me on board for that. Dude, of course. But my man, thank you for coming through. I think we got all the bullet points here, all, all the fun stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming out. Anything half hearted release that we want to plug? Anything we got to know about coming up? Um, we're working on booking a show. Ooh. So we, I mean, we released so much music recently. This is true. We were kind of, me and Jay were just having the conversation, like, should we release a song around the time of the show? But we haven't played a show since we released our album. So we've released 20 songs since we played a show. So we probably don't have to. (laughs) Probably okay, yeah. We should probably play, like, half of those ones at the show. Yeah, And then see how that goes. (laughs) Oh yeah, man! I'm looking forward but, to it. Yeah, but I think so. Yeah, if I don't know when this is coming out, but end of January ish, we're gonna have a show in Connecticut. Fire! I don't know if it's gonna be out by end of January, but I'll aim and we'll, we'll figure it out. The audience will know, but we have no idea at the moment. We'll, we'll both be there. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good, my man. I appreciate you coming through, dude. Thank yeah, you for we'll having me. Soon. Thank you. Deuces, sick cut.